So there's this snack here in India that I love, hot chips. These are specifically banana chips, and you can get them in all kinds of varieties and flavors. Different vegetables and fruits can be turned into these chips, and they're delicious. But let's imagine that this guy in the purple shirt wants to take his business online. He wants to become a pan-India direct-to-consumer brand. How does he do that? Well, one option is that he can start a website and begin selling his chips online. But he'll need to make a pretty large upfront investment to do that. He'll need to create a website or an online storefront, which isn't impossible. He could use an e-commerce technology company like Dukan, for example. But then there's cataloging, inventory management, dynamic pricing, order management, order fulfillment, and optimization of delivery costs. And he might get some of those things or even all of those things from an e-commerce technology company. But even with all of those things, are people gonna wanna buy hot chips from him online? Will people even notice his brand? If he has a shop on the side of the road, that's instant customer acquisition. Someone is driving along, they spot his store, and they buy his chips. But online, it's going to be really, really hard for him to get noticed. He'll need to spend tons of money buying website or social media ads so that his products stand out. And this is why a lot of small business owners in India choose to stay offline. If they're on the side of the road, they might need to compete with one or two other nearby stores, but that's it. The competition is minimal. Whereas online, you're literally competing with every other online hot chips company. And to do that, to compete, the amount of time, money, and energy required just causes a lot of people to give up before they've even started. But there is one alternative, something that started here in India in the mid to late aughts, e-commerce marketplaces. Sellers can list their products on an e-commerce platform like Amazon or Flipkart, and everything is taken care of, including exposure. Just by being on one of these platforms, their products will automatically get recommended to consumers. And if they're good, if their products get purchased frequently and customers are satisfied, then sellers can make a lot of money, far more than they might have if they were only selling direct to consumer on their own website or offline. And that's the allure of these e-commerce platforms. They've made the barrier to entry so low that sellers feel comfortable and confident listing their products on them. That was one of the keys to them being able to establish a monopoly here in India. They made it easy for sellers to sell stuff online. But here's the catch. These are one, American-owned companies. Amazon has been an American company from day one, and Flipkart is an Indian company headquartered in Singapore and owned by an American company, Walmart. And two, these are companies, which might be a problem. They're not public pieces of infrastructure. These are giant businesses with one primary objective, making money. And they do this with control. They are the middleman. They indirectly take money from buyers. They indirectly take money from sellers. And we're okay with that, not because it's something that we're happy with, but because there just aren't a lot of great alternatives. It's kind of like Google. You could go to the library and look stuff up in books, or you could use an alternative like Bing or DuckDuckGo, but let's be real here. Google is Google. And that's the way it is with e-commerce. Amazon is Amazon, Flipkart is Flipkart, and nothing can replace them. So if you're the government of India, you identify these problems. These are American platforms with a monopoly in India, and these are companies that will do anything to make more money. How do you solve these problems though? Well, that is where ONDC comes in. And I'm gonna be explaining how it works and more specifically how it might benefit D to C startups, because that's what we talk about here at Backstage with Millionaires, startups right after this. So right off the bat, I wanna be absolutely clear about this so that there's no misunderstanding because I do think a lot of people are confused about this. ONDC is not a replacement for Amazon or Flipkart or any other e-commerce offering. This is not a competing platform. In fact, it's not a platform at all. Instead, ONDC is a network that sellers, apps, websites, e-commerce platforms, basically any seller that is interacting with a buyer can join. And we've already got companies like Paytm Mall, PhonePay, eCart, which is Flipkart's logistics arm, and Dunzo figuring out how to integrate their offerings with ONDC. And companies like ITC, Unilever, Dubor, Nivea, Shopify, Google, Misho, and Snapdeal have shown interest. And the reason that they've shown interest and they're being so cooperative is that ONDC isn't an app. It's not an aggregator. It's not a source of competition. It is a network. And I think that might be a little bit difficult for some of us to wrap our heads around. So let me explain it in a different way. 
different way. So UPI is kind of like the digital payments version of ONDC. It's a piece of digital infrastructure, but it isn't its own app. It's not replacing PhonePay and Google Pay or Paytm. It's just there's a foundation for them to build on. Now you do have BHIM, which is the NPCI's default UPI app, but it's not trying to compete with the private players in India's digital payment space. It's just there as an option in case people want to use it. But ONDC isn't even going to have its own BHIM-like app. So then the obvious question is, how are you going to shop with ONDC if it doesn't have an app or a website? Well, you won't. It'll happen automatically. See, any existing platform can sign up with and join the ONDC network. And when they do that, all of the existing products that are listed on their platform end up on the ONDC network too. So what this means is that if you're accessing, say, Mintra as a shopper, and this is a hypothetical situation, let's just say that Mintra has joined ONDC and you're shopping for clothes. Well, you might see clothes that are listed on other platforms too, like for example, D2C brands like Bombay Shirt Company or Nicobar. And these are two brands that, to my knowledge, are not currently on Amazon or Flipkart or Mintra. And if I had to guess why, it's probably a control thing. They don't wanna give these platforms control over their products. They, as a D2C brand, wanna set their own rules. So if and when they join ONDC, it's gonna give them the exposure that they would have had if they were listed on these e-commerce platforms, but with none of the downsides. And this idea becomes even more powerful when we're talking about diverse marketplaces that are literally built for D2C brands, like for example, Dukan. And I'll show you what I mean here. Let's say that instead of ordering from Mintra, you wanna buy clothes from a local store. So you plug in your location, I'm here in Bengaluru, then you choose a category, fashion garments and clothing, and then you hit search. See all of these offerings? If Dukan were to join ONDC when it officially launches, then all of these sellers, because their stores are built on Dukan's platform, would be able to gain access to the benefits of ONDC too. And it's through platforms like Dukan that ONDC can become a powerful option, not just for big D2C brands, but also small individual sellers who have created online storefronts with platforms like Dukan. With Dukan, they can make a website, they can list products on that website, they can manage their inventory, take orders from customers, fulfill those orders, and ultimately receive payments. And on top of all of that, they also gain access to services like marketing and customer management. And Dukan also has tie-ups with platforms like Privy and MailChimp too. So for a seller, this is the one platform that they'll need to get online and stay online successfully. And I know that many of you watching this video have thought and dreamed about starting a business, selling products or services online, but maybe all of the stuff involved in doing that is just too overwhelming. There's too many challenges to overcome. Kind of like that guy selling hot chips in the purple shirt at the beginning of the video, where you feel like the only option that you have is to sell on giant e-commerce platforms that take a huge cut out of your revenue and might even steal your idea. And Dukan might be the solution here. So if Dukan sounds like the platform for you, then click on the link in the description or the pinned comment down below and start selling online today. See, right now, the online e-commerce shopping experience for Indians is a lot like a giant department store. If we're talking about India, maybe we could compare it to a D-Mart, or if you're watching this video from North America, then it would be more like a Costco. And these stores are full of products from various brands, but the stores themselves are owned by a company, and that company sets its own rules. They choose which items are displayed prominently at the front of the store, which items are stashed near the back where most people won't see them, they choose which items are stocked and which items are rejected, and their main objective, of course, is to make money. They don't fundamentally or primarily care about the people in the store, they don't care about the companies who make the products on their shelves, and if a product starts to perform well, they can technically just copy it and sell their own version at a cheaper price. They're the store, they set their own rules, and this makes it super hard for D2C brands to compete on these platforms. Now, I say D2C brand here, which might be a little bit confusing because doesn't being on an e-commerce platform sort of invalidate that D2C title? Wouldn't it be indirect to consumer because they're going through a middleman like Amazon or Flipkart? meaning that they're not selling directly to consumers? Well, that's the thing. Pure Play D2C is really uncommon here in India because e-commerce platforms provide brands with incredible amounts of exposure. They are product discovery platforms for consumers, which means that when you search for baby skincare on Amazon, Mama Earth and The Moms Co are gonna be there at the top of the page. And that's great for their business. That's exposure that they wouldn't be getting if they didn't make their products available on Amazon in the first place. But there's also a risk associated with this because if a brand does too well, Amazon might take notice. 
And if they take notice, well, they've got all of the data at their fingertips and they can copy whatever Mama Earth or the Moms Co are doing, slap a Solimo sticker on it. That's one of their private labels, which they created specifically for the Indian market. They can lower the price to a number that Mama Earth and the Moms Co just can't compete with. And they could, in theory, start profiting off this stolen idea. Now, I just wanna be absolutely clear here. This kind of anti-competitive behavior is not allowed in India. And so far, it hasn't been proven by the CCI, the Competition Commission of India, that Amazon or Flipkart have committed anti-competitive behavior. The CCI's probe into Amazon and Flipkart hasn't been concluded yet. They've been looking into whether or not these companies have been behaving in an anti-competitive way since 2020, and the probe is still ongoing. And the same thing is happening now, actually, in 2022 with Swiggy and Zomato. And there may be more companies that they're looking into, but the bottom line here is that this is a trend. It's something that's very hard for these companies to resist. They have all this data, they're launching in-house private labels, and they want these brands to succeed. And so it's not a stretch to imagine that they're secretly using this data that they've collected to find this success to the detriment of smaller brands. Now, coming back to that retail store analogy, if private e-commerce platforms are like retail stores, then ONDC would kind of be like a giant shopping mall. You've got tons of retail stores, grocery stores, restaurants, small kiosks, basically any online platform where a seller can sell something to a buyer is allowed to be on ONDC. And the owners of this massive shopping mall, the government of India, set the rules. This is a way for them to gain more control and oversight over e-commerce in India, which frankly has been going off the rails a bit because like I said, big e-commerce platforms only care about one thing, making money. With ONDC, these big e-commerce platforms are gonna have to come compete with smaller stores, websites, and brands in ways that they've never had to before. And this is gonna open up so many opportunities for D2C startups to shine, because currently, if an e-commerce giant wants to copy the products of a small D2C brand, then the impact that this has on the brand is massive. Basically, if the D2C brand here is getting some of or most of its traffic from a giant e-commerce platform, then that revenue source shrinks significantly when the e-commerce platform copies their product, or it might even dry up altogether because said e-commerce giant might be intentionally siphoning away traffic from the D2C product and redirecting it towards their own cheaper private label product instead. And some D2C brands may even choose to avoid e-commerce platforms altogether because of this risk. But with ONDC, with the playing field level, this D2C product will, in theory, still get the traffic that it deserves and possibly even more on top of that. With ONDC, consumers who are shopping on these e-commerce websites will see these products recommended and they'll see them on other websites too. They'll see them on basically any ONDC compatible app or website that the D2C brand wants their product to be listed on, irrespective of whether or not these websites want that to happen. And the best part is that these D2C brands will be closer to pure play direct to consumer brands now. They can set up their website and their social media and focus exclusively on marketing for those channels. And as long as they've signed up with ONDC and their products are listed on the ONDC network, then they'll get residual traffic from from said network without having to spend any extra money. And of course, they'll also get benefits like dynamic pricing, inventory management, and optimization of delivery costs. They'll be getting cataloging, order management, and order fulfillment. But most importantly, they'll be getting control and free exposure. Now, one downside here, of course, is that when you open the floodgates and allow any seller to list on any platform, suddenly you're competing with a much larger number of brands and companies. But as long as your products are high quality and priced competitively, in theory, you should be able to withstand this competition. But what about brands that aren't making high quality products? Brands that are making misleading or inferior products? Will they get undeserved exposure from ONDC? Back in 2015, a customer who ordered an iPhone from Flipkart got mad mangoes instead. In 2016, a man who ordered a Canon camera from Amazon got a brick instead. These are India's leading e-commerce platforms, and they've worked hard to ensure that these kinds of incidents don't happen regularly. It's bad PR for them, which is why they've spent huge amounts of time and money to fix these issues as best they can. And even though they've hit these little bumps in the road from time to time, I, as a consumer, trust these e-commerce platforms over alternatives. When I go to a D2C company's website to shop, I'm there for the product. But when I go to Amazon or Flipkart, it's not usually because of any one specific product. It's because I trust these platforms. Because I know that if I order something and it's broken or the delivery 
delivery is delayed or something goes wrong, I can complain and get a refund or replacement. And if neither one of those things work, then I can complain on the internet and eventually some customer support person on Twitter will help me out. But with ONDC with the playing field level, what's to stop platforms who don't care as much about after sale support, about product quality, about timely shipping and customer centricity? What's to stop them from diverting sales away from these trusted platforms to their own platforms where they can rip people off? With ONDC, I worry that these platforms might get undeserved exposure. And I do trust that there will be a filtration process here that platforms who don't force their sellers to abide by the rules will either be kicked off of ONDC or their prominence will go down. They won't be getting as much visibility, but people always find ways around these filters. For example, sellers might get bots to review or like their products, or they might even order products to trick the platforms that they're selling on into thinking that their products are selling a lot. And so I worry that people will be able to abuse or manipulate ONDC to their own benefit. And I worry that this is gonna result in people ending up buying sketchy products from platforms that they didn't intend to shop on. I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. Let's say you're on Swiggy and you're looking to order some Chicken 65 and you find a great place. It's a bit pricey, it's a little bit far away, but it's rated highly and it's hygienic. But then through the ONDC network, you find a place where it's cheaper, it's closer, and the pictures just make it look even more delicious. But it's not on Swiggy. It's on some random platform that you've never heard of, but you decide to take a risk and you get food poisoning. And I know that this example seems really contrived, but I'm just trying to paint a picture of what might end up happening if people are being diverted away from the platforms that they love and trust onto other platforms that they're not familiar with that might be more sketchy and unsafe. One other concern that I have, and this is gonna sound a little bit weird, but I worry about the impact that this is gonna have on big e-commerce players. Because they don't want the playing field to be level. They don't want transparent pricing. They don't want anyone and everyone to be able to sell on their platform. They don't wanna give up control because that's gonna cause them to lose money. And so my prediction here is that these e-commerce giants are gonna figure out a way to have their cake and eat it too. They'll happily join ONDC, and that'll be the light version of their platform, the free version which complies with all of ONDC's rules. And then they'll set up a secondary line of business, a new premium platform for paying members, which is separate from ONDC. And as we all know, Amazon is already nicely set up for this. They have Amazon Prime. And my guess is that this will become a separate website or maybe a toggle that members can click on to switch between the premium version of the website and the ONDC version of the website. And if this happens across multiple platforms, then ONDC may come to be associated with lower quality, less buyer safety and security, and shoddy after sales support. That's my fear anyways. Now, that's just a prediction, obviously, but I'm curious to know, what are your predictions? How are things gonna change with ONDC? What should we expect? Is it going to be seismic or is it going to be underwhelming? Is it going to be beneficial or is it going to be detrimental? Let me know what your thoughts are in a comment down below and I will see you in the next one.